Good morning and welcome to One Cause Church. It is so wonderful to have you all with us this morning. Please stand and join us for worship. Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in his blood. Jesus, Lord of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come.
more 
Yeah. 
shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Oh, amen. Oh, amen. Oh, amen. family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming in your going in your weeping and rejoicing
amen or amen, you know, we're not just singing that because it's in the Bible, but it has power. When we sing that, we're saying, so be it. Let this be in my life. Let this favor be upon the life of me and my grandkids and my great grandkids because the, pa- the, oh my God, the favor of God is so powerful that it, it goes beyond just your life, but it's for your whole family. It's for the family that's coming after you. Psalm Five, verse 12 says, For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor you will surround him as with a shield. That's what God does for the righteous. His favor surrounds you because you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are righteous. So his favor is surrounding you like a shield. And his favor, it's, it's pleasure, delight, it's goodwill, it's acceptance, it's desire. He's got goodwill for your life in every situation. You know, it's not just for you while you're at church. It's not just in certain situations, but his favor surrounds you like a shield. That means it's with you everywhere you go. That means when the enemy's trying to attack you from beside or behind or wherever it is, God's favor is protecting you. His favor is is going before you. The Bible says that the Lord will go before you and he will be your rear guard that wherever you go, God's gone before you. Wherever you've been, God's back there. He's covering your past. It doesn't matter what your day looks like, what your work looks like, what your situation looks like. God's favor is surrounding you like a shield and that's protection. That's divine appointments. That's maybe if you've been discriminated against in a certain situation or environment, God's favor is greater than that. And and God's not looking at you based on the things that you've done or or what you look like or what your job is, but his favor is with you every second, every day, no matter what. God, uh, we thank you just so much just for your favor, the the, the power of the favor that you have for our lives, God, that it doesn't matter what the economy looks like. God, your favor is, is stronger. It doesn't matter what our bank account looks like. God, your favor is stronger. It doesn't matter what bad things we've done or or, or what things we deserve. God, your favor, it's more powerful than that. And I thank you for blessing every single person here. And not only them, but their family and their kids and and their great grandkids. God, I just thank you that your favor, it supersedes anything that we experience in the natural and any situation that we find ourselves in. God, bless them, provide for them. We thank you this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Why don't you wave hi to somebody and take a seat. I've got some some good announcements for all of you. I I hope you like good news because we've got some good things going on. Um, First, I want to remind you that we do have a prayer group that meets here every Sunday from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And I want to encourage you, if you're free this afternoon, come be a part of that. There's just something powerful when the people of God get together and just pray and just declare things over not only their lives, but the lives of the people they know over the church, over the country. And and so it's, it's powerful. So if you're free... Come check it out. Um, If you have something that we can be praying for you for, then please submit that. There's a a place in our app where you can actually go do that. And it's just comforting to know that we've got people that are praying for you. Amen? And so that's the first thing we got going on. And then up next, um, we actually have a lot of things coming up for December. You know, the holidays, I know when they come, they hit you like fast, right? Like everything comes up at once. We got Thanksgiving coming up and then we've got all of our Christmas things happening. Okay. So we want to go ahead and just give you our calendar so you can get your phone out. You can take a picture of that. You can put it in your calendar, but save the dates because all of these things are going to be just so special. First, we've got December 4th. That's a Friday evening at seven o'clock. We've got our women's Christmas party. Okay. Uh, we, ha- we have that every year and I know all the ladies have a, a great time. Um, here's the, the, the cool part about the party this year is it's free. For re, all right, that means no money. That means just show up at 7 o'clock. They're going to take care of you. If you want to participate in the gift exchange, um, then you can bring an individually wrapped gift, and you can participate in that as well. And then the next thing we have, December 13th, we've got One Cause Family and Friends Christmas, which uh, if if you've been a part of this in the past, you know how special it is. It's a Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. Um, and, and this is where we get to showcase the talent that we have in the church. So if you've got talent, you know, if you've got some kind of performance that you want to provide for the church, then please, please, by all means, do that. Everybody's welcome to sign up. You can actually sign up in the app, and then more details are in the app as well. Uh, but we'd love to have you participate. And even if you're not performing, just come and hang out. It's such a, a just a special 
evening that we have with our One Cause family and friends. So make plans to be at that. And then you'll see that we've also got a Christmas cantata, December 20th, candlelight service, December 24th. You can find all the details in our app. Uh, you're not, you're not going to remember half of them if I give them to you now anyway. So just go check out the app and then make sure you uh, mark that in your calendar and that you participate in whatever you can uh, for the month of December. Awesome. Well, now we're going to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. So uh, there's a couple ways that we want to encourage you to give. First, you can give through our website at onecausechurch.com slash give. You can also just download our app, make it easy, quick, convenient. You can find us on the App Store, iPhones, Androids, whatever you got. We got an app for you. Super easy. If you have a check, cash envelope, whatever it is, you can also give that uh, in the security box at the back on your way out of service this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18 says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. It says that the Lord gives you the power to get wealth. And and this isn't just something that applies to a select few Christians. Um, This is actually something that, that God gives every single one of you the power. He gives you the power to obtain wealth. And, and, and so I think a lot of people um, kind of exempt themselves from that verse. I think a lot of people think that God doesn't necessarily want them to be wealthy or obtain wealth. But I want to let you know that this verse, you know, this is actually written for you. God has given you the power to obtain wealth. So have any of you, raise your hand if you've ever been to a circus before. Okay, if you've been to a circus, you may have seen an act with a lion Um, a a lion tamer. If not, you've probably seen it in the movies or on TV or something. Uh, But the the very iconic picture of a lion tamer taming the lion is he's holding this bar stool, right? And he's actually taming the lion with the bar stool, and the the lion doesn't attack him. And so I always thought that that was just, you know, something cute for, for the movies or for TV, but that's actually what they do. And so I was wondering why this actually prevents the lion from attacking the tamer. And I read about it, but apparently, you know, a lion can only focus on one thing at a time. And so when it's catching a prey, it has to be able to focus all of its attention on that prey. And so the fact that the tamer is holding a bar stool, it actually distracts the lion. He's got four legs to focus on, and it prevents him from actually focusing on that and the human. And so because of that, the lion just gets confused, and it gets paralyzed in confusion, and it just doesn't do anything. And that's crazy to me to think that the entire time the lion could easily destroy this human, like easily, but it stopped by just a distraction. You know, I, I, the, the Lord has given you the power to get wealth, and, and I think a lot of times we get distracted from that truth. You know, you may be looking at your bank account. You may be looking at the bills. You may be looking at your income, and you may be thinking, oh, wow, well, that situation is so extreme that I don't have the power to get wealth. But the truth is, God has still given you the power to obtain wealth. He still has provision and prosperity for your life. And all it takes is is getting your eyes off of the distractions and then off of, of the situations that make you doubt God and doubt that ability and start turning them to Jesus. Start looking into Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith, that if you'll get your your focus off of the distraction and onto God, then you'll start accessing the abundance that he has for your life. And all you got to do is just just reach out to God and say, God, I trust you. I believe your word above my situation, and I expect your blessing in my life. And I want to challenge you. One of the, the, there's something special about giving, where just something about giving just helps you tap into the blessing of God in your life. It's such a great step of faith. It's saying, you know, I'm not going to be focused on on what my bank account says, but I'm just going to give it to God, and I'm just going to trust him to provide for me every step of the way. So if you have something to give, I really want to encourage you to do so because it'll. I, I promise you, like, there's something about it that just unlocks God's blessing and favor. And if you'll just step out in faith and trust him this morning, I, I promise he will not let you down. Let's pray. God, thank you so much just for every person that's gathered here to hear your word this morning, to worship you this morning. God, that right now they're going to get their eyes and their focus off of the distractions and on to you. God, because you've given them the power to obtain wealth. And I thank you just that, that every person here is just accepting that truth into their lives. God, that that truth is greater than their circumstance and their situation. 
God, and I thank you for blessing them so abundantly, God, that you're just opening the floodgates of heaven onto their lives, God, that that they're not going to even be able to to contain the blessings that you have for them. It's going to be overflowing in their lives. God, bless them. Take care of the debt. Take care of the lack. Take care of it all, God, because you're good and you love them, and that's I know that that's your will for their lives. So we thank you for that, Father, this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, amen. Well, up next, we've got Pastor Eric, who's got today's message. Turn this on first. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Alex. Appreciate you very much. It's good to see everybody here. My mother is here with us today. Great to have Mama Holler with us today. <clears throat> All right, we're going to go to the book of Acts, chapter 9, um, uh, titled today's message, God Has a Vision for You. God has a vision for you. And we're going to look at three different instances in the life of Paul the Apostle where he had a vision. Uh, there's, there's more than just these three, but we're going to focus on these three, and we're going to see what, <clears throat> how this relates to us today in the, this modern-day church, this age of, uh, that's so different from the time then, and yet the thing that is similar about all of us is that we're all human. And so from that perspective, we're going to see three key things about these visions and what God's vision for you looks like. All right, number one, God has a vision for you for a new beginning. Number two, God has a vision in this world of the need for you and your giftings. And number three, God has a vision for you to connect and to be planted, to connect and be planted. So Acts chapter 9, and this is where <clears throat> Saul of Tarsus is about, his whole world is about to shift. His whole world is about to change. Um, you know, whenever I look at, the life of this man who formerly was Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle, he is one, to, for me personally, he is one of the key evidences, his life, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Because of the dramatic shift of his uh, life, his conversion was so dramatic. We're talking about a man who was highly gifted, highly trained up. I mean, one of the uh, requirements to be a, the kind of man that he was as far as religion goes, as far as being a Pharisee, was that he had to have the first five books of the Bible memorized. All right, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, num Numbers for Pete's sake. Have you ever read Numbers, right? It is painful. It's just a painful book to read because it's all about numbers. Now, you might be a mathematician here, and you might just love that book. God bless you. Then there's Deuteronomy. So they, they, they had to know these things by heart, word for word. And not only that, but he was extremely zealous for his religion. He, uh, my dad used to say it like this. Saul of Tarsus was the Osama bin Laden of his day. All right? He was an absolute terror to the church to the people of God. He wanted to destroy the church. He wanted to do away with it, and he was doing everything he could to stop it and to blaspheme the name of the Lord Jesus because this man, even though he had a great conviction, you know, somebody with a conviction can be extremely dangerous. <laughs> That's the thing about some of these groups around the world, these terrorists, because they have a conviction about what they're doing. They're not just mindless killers. They actually believe that they are doing the work of God. This is what Saul of Tarsus thought. He thought he was working on behalf of God. And see, what he's about to figure out on the road to Damascus is that you cannot be pro-God and anti-Christ. All right? So this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the collision happens, if you will. Then Saul, verse 1 of Acts 9, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. All right? As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone round him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? 
It's quite an admission here, isn't it? Though Saul of Tarsus knows this is the Lord, he also has to admit right here in this moment, he doesn't know who the Lord is. He thought he knew, but now he doesn't know. Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord, Jesus, then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. You know what the goads are. The goad was that, that stick, if you will, that had a sharp point on the end of it that was used to motivate the oxen if they got stubborn in the plowing. And they would pick the, or prick the back of their, their leg right here, right around this area where the skin is real thin. Just, let me just motivate you a little bit. And oh, well, they would, they would get to moving again. So he says, hard for you to kick against the ghost. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then he said to him, arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Later on in Paul's life, he's giving an account of his conversion to a king by the name of King Agrippa. And so um, in Acts 26, 19, he says to King Agri Agrippa, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So Paul calls his conversion experience a vision from God. And so a vision is a very real experience. The first vision Paul had was about his new beginning. Jesus was giving the man known as Saul of Tarsus an opportunity to start over. And I believe that the Lord did this because of a man by the name of Stephen. In Acts chapter 8, you read the story about Stephen, who would later become the first martyr of the church through Saul of Tarsus, consenting at his death. And Stephen is preaching to his Jewish brethren, and he's, it's the longest sermon recorded in the Bible, pretty much the entire chapter of, of, of uh, Acts 8. And Acts chapter 8, it ends up where he is, he's really just giving them a scathing rebuke over the, the years of them killing the prophets of God, their lack of belief in the Lord, and their, their he called them stiff-necked, or which means rebellious or stubborn. And so, I mean, he's just laying it on them. And so they get so fed up with him that they drag him out of town and they start stoning him to death, throwing, pelting him with rocks. And Jews were experts at this, just like the Romans were experts at torture and uh, crucifixion and all those kinds of things. The Jews did not halfway stone anybody, okay? They stone, the, once the stoning starts, they do it until you're dead. There is no half stoning. So th they're in the process of doing this, and one of the most amazing things happens that as they start to um, rain down rocks upon him, Stephen says, look, I see heaven open, and I see the Son of man sitting, or standing, actually, he said, at the right hand of God. And it made them even angrier. But what was interesting was that he went from accusing them and calling them out for all of their sins to when he saw Jesus, his entire language changed. And when he saw him, he said these words, Lord, don't lay this charge against them. Well, Stephen, that's all you've been doing, man, is laying a charge against them. But when he saw Jesus, when he looked mercy and grace in the eyes, he started to talk like him. When Jesus was on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And here Stephen gets a glimpse of this merciful God, this merciful Savior, and he can't help but pray mercy. And then he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, and he fell asleep. And I believe that Jesus heard those words of Stephen and took them very serious, so serious that he says, don't lay this charge against them. Them, one of them being in that them was Saul of Tarsus, standing there watching this happen. And I believe that Jesus looked at Saul at this moment and said, okay, I won't charge him. I'll call him instead. And so he meets Saul here. On the road, Saul don't know what to do. He's blown away, right? He thought the very God he was fighting for, uh, he found out in this moment, the very God he was fighting for, he was fighting against. He'd been living a contradiction to the truth. And so now he calls this a heavenly vision. You know, every day, this morning, the sun came up it, it, for a new beginning. Every 
sunrise, it speaks of a new beginning. Every spring that comes around, it speaks of a new beginning. Every new year, we're about to come into a new year. Aren't you ready to be out of 2020? So sick of this year. Ready for 2021. Let's flip. Let's, let's turn the page already. Huh? Here I am on the road again. And there I go up on the stage. <laughs> we found within the ancient of time, we see multitudes of new beginnings. When God put his spirit in you, there was rebirth. A new creation was realized. That's not the only new beginning that God has in store for you. Throughout your life experiences, your choices, your actions, your thoughts, he provides new beginnings all along the way. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for that. I've made choices where I needed a new beginning, a new start. Through your outward man, or though your outward man, the Bible says, is perishing, your inner man, your spirit is being renewed every day. There's newness always happening in you. Right now, there's newness happening because you are a new creation. Not just where you are every day a new creation in Christ Jesus. So that means you can always have hope because there's a greater thing at work in you. It's greater than your failures. It's greater than your faults. It's greater than your bad choices. It's the power of the love and grace of Almighty God. And that love rushes in. See, God's not just a God of second chances. I'm standing here as a testimony to a God of many, many, many chances. Hmm? I know I'm the only one here, and you guys are all perfect, so I've got a lot of catching up to do. But thank you for your patience. <laughs> Amen. His grace abounds much more than any of our abounding sins. It's like they never existed. You know, and to God, he's so over our sins that that's what it seems like, doesn't it? He is forgiven. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus took away all of them. Past, present, future. God, what a mercy, what a love. Today you may feel like you're stuck in the same old thing. What's the phrase? That, no, I can't say it in church. Same old, beep, different day. But God has a new beginning for you right now. Look to him. Believe things not only can, but they will change because the God who never changes is always changing things. Amen. Acts chapter 16. Let's look there for a moment. The second, the second, sep, <laughs> it's the first day with my new tongue. All right. 16, 8. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, Paul is trying to go spread the word or actually even go catch up on some churches that he had pioneered sometime earlier. This is what's known as his second missionary journey. Paul had three. So this is the second time around. So he's wanting to go. I'm just, just watching my hands here. This is our map. There's Asia. Okay. Asia is made up. This is where the Colossian church is, the Galatian churches are over here in this Asia area. So he's trying to go back to some of these cities that he's visited before. And every time he gets to the city, the Holy Spirit says, no, not here. No, not here. And you can read that account in Acts chapter uh, 16, which is, that's where we are right here. And so finally they get down to a place called Troas, right? Y'all, you may have ever see the movie Troy. All right. That's where, that's Troas. All right. At the time it was called Troas. And so Paul gets there and he's just trying to follow the Holy Spirit. He's been refused in every town. They get there, and then it says, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night, a man of Macedonia. So here's Asia. Well, Macedonia is west of there. you got to cross this channel of water to get over here. And this is where we're going to find the church at Philippi, uh, Corinth, Thessalonica, all those, those places. Okay, so this vision appears. A man says, come over to help us. So um, this this shows all of us something here that God has a vision in this world of the need for you and your gifts. This man is saying in this vision, you have something that we need and what you have is going to help us. All right? You have something in your own life that this world needs. You have something that will help others. Every one of us is born with some gift from God. Some of you have multiple gifts, Amen. right? It doesn't, but the key is, is that you unlock those gifts. 
because you're born for such a time as this. You're on the earth at this time for this purpose. All right? So the reason he wants you to be strong is because the world needs you. Now, though, even those that are in your life may not understand that you are actually what they want or need. You're certainly what they need. And so you need to remember that. Uh, I was telling our, the 930 service, my mother knew when I was a kid that I needed to sleep. I didn't know that I needed to sleep, right? I didn't know I needed to take a nap. Who has time for that, right? Our daughter Laurel is that way. She didn't want to miss out on anything. She never wanted to sleep. Didn't, she certainly didn't take naps, and she certainly did not like to go down to bed at night. She just thought she should be awake so that she wouldn't miss out on anything that was happening in the world. But we knew better, right? You as a parent, you know better than that. You know that that's what they need. You have gifts that this world needs, and you have something in you that nobody else in this church has. Your family, your friends, your church, your community needs you. They need the gifts that were put in you by Almighty God. And sometimes it can feel like that your gift is out of place, that, um, that they're, you might feel like this isn't the place for the gift that's in you. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that it actually is. Or maybe you don't know what that gifting is. And sometimes, uh, well, I'll just tell you a story. When uh, my brother and I lived in, uh, we'd gotten in our early 20s, so we moved out of our parents' house and we moved into a little farmhouse in Grape Creek, which is just a town north of San Angelo. And, uh, and our, our friend Stephen, who, you know, was playing guitar up here, he'd come over and we'd hang out and play guitar and all that kind of stuff. Well, I came in from work one night and we had a long driveway that pulled up to this old farmhouse. And so I decided I was going to, I was just going to sneak in. So I I turned the lights off in my car and just kind of coasted all the way up. Because out there, you know, we were out in the country, so there was, when the lights were out, it was dark, right? So I, I coasted all the way up to, to the house. And I don't remember how, but I got my brother's attention from inside the house. And so I told him, I said, I want, <laughs> I'm going to hide in this little area over here. You, we came in through our, the back porch. It was like a screened-in porch. And you walk in, and there was like a little storage area over here. And then you're going through the back door into the kitchen. And so I told him, I said, I want you to um, somehow get, pot, I, you know, we call him Potsy. But anyway, get him out, outside and, and I'm going to scare the bejesus out of him. So uh, Brandon, I'm making some noise back there, right? So my brother's like, what is that? And so he says, uh, I hear Stephen say, uh, let me, I'll grab the gun. And I'm like, oh. So, <laughs> so he, he grabs, we had a shotgun that just kind of propped up in the corner of the kitchen. So Stephen grabs a shotgun. My brother grabs one of those mag light flashlights, you know. So Brandon's thinking, he's like, I got to get that gun from him. He's going to kill my brother. <laughs> and so uh, so as, as they're talking, I can hear him. And then I hear my brother said, hey, let me see that for just a second. Here, hold this flashlight. And so Brandon's acting like he's got to make sure the bullets are in it or whatever, you know. So he gets the gun from him. So that made me feel better. I knew Brandon had it. And so I hear him shuck the shell, you know, like, oh, we're going out of here meeting business, you know. And so they make their way out of the back door. And then they go all the way in the backyard, out past where I am. And so I make another noise. And so that way, you know, they can find the direction of where this noise is coming from. Well, Stephen is, a, is in the lead now. And so he starts walking back toward the porch, opens that screen door, and I make a, just another little noise to the side. So he walks in there with that flashlight, and I come out of there, Wah! like this. And he starts clicking the flashlight on and off, on and off, <laughs> like this at me. And I'm thinking, thank God I didn't have the gun. I mean, that, he's trying to pull the trigger on me, you know. A flashlight had a, it was out of its purpose. <laughs> Listen, you might feel like you're a flashlight where in the hands of somebody who needs a gun when it comes to your gifting, but there's a place for your gifting. There's a time and there's a place and there's a purpose for it. And God has a wonderful vision for every gifting that you have. Just realize this truth today, that Paul was not in his hometown when he got this vision not a hometown of Tarsus. He was in Troas. Paul was on the move. And many times you're going to see your gifting unlock as you do something. 
You might not know exactly what to do, but what I'm saying is every service in the house of God, this is where I would start if I were you. It's where I started, and I know what it did for me, is it starts somewhere. And then this is when, as you're moving, that the Lord can direct your steps. It's hard to steer a parked car, isn't it? So he can steer you as you go and define for you what it is precisely that he's called you to do. Got to get busy doing something before you know what you're really supposed to do. In the infant stages of the church, this problem arose. And the, and the problem was that they were distributing the bread every day um, for especially the, the poor widows. And as well as the poor, but especially for the widows. They were the first on, the, on their priority list. Well, there was this, this kind of this fighting that broke out amongst the widows because there are some widows who were Jews, but they were called Hellenistic Jews. Now, the Hellenistic Jews were those who adopted Greek culture. They, they were Jews, but they spoke Greek and they ate Greek food like super gyros, heroes, whatever those are called, gyros. What are they called? Heroes? Heroes. <laughs> when, I, when, when I lived in San Angeles, remember the, the mall? Remember, we, call, we all called it super gyro. We didn't know any better than that. So I, I call them gyros for years. <laughs> Heroes, that's right. Okay, so anyway, so they adopted, so to, to an Orthodox Jew or to a fundamental Jew, that was like, you might as well just be a Gentile then, right? You, you're just nasty. <laughs> and so there's a squabble that breaks out because the Hellenistic Jews, the, 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 the widows were saying that they were being overlooked in the daily distribution and more than likely they were right. Some prejudice going on there. So Peter says, listen, we don't have time to deal with squabbling widows. We have to dedicate ourselves to the word and to prayer. Let's raise up some men who will take care of this. Can you imagine? So they chose seven guys, seven men to be deacons. All right, they're the first deacons ordained in the church. And two of those men's names were Stephen and Philip. And something happened at that choosing. Now, there were two things that they that were required of these two men or these seven deacons uh, to be able to do this work and that was that they'd be full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit and how many of you know if you're going to deal with squabbling women you need to be full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost right you need God's help so they're, they're basically wait, waiting tables, right? They're trying to make sure everybody gets their stuff. But something started happening. The Bible says that miracles and signs and wonders started happening at the hands of Stephen. He started just by keeping the peace and getting everybody the right amount of bread, an even amount. But, and yet God began to step in and reveal something that was in Stephen. Signs, miracles, and wonders began to happen. Philip. Be, went down to Samaria. He has a huge revival, right? And then, and then he's later known as Philip the Evangelist, from Philip the Waiter from, to Philip the Evangelist. But both of their services started where? They started in the church. And a very humble assignment. And yet, we saw and see their gift began to blossom. This is what I want to encourage you to do. Anywhere that you can give yourself to some kind of service, that's where your gifts are really going to be honed, that your skills are going to be honed. The gifts in you are placed there by God may very well be waiting on you to do something, even if you don't think you're called to it. If I were to ask you, who's the greatest running back of all time? There would be several different opinions here. Some, some would say Barry Sanders. Some would say uh, O.J. Simpson. Some would say Jim Brown. Earl Campbell, Walter Payton, Sweetness, Eric Dickerson, Eric Holler. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but all of that, there are these opinions, but the truth is the stats point to a man by the name of Emmett Smith. Right? Now, no doubt, Emmett Smith was not the fastest guy. He wasn't the strongest guy, but he had longevity. Do you know what? He attributed his longevity to his chiropractor, of all people. But he also had a really good line. Y'all remember what the, the, the Cowboys offensive line was in the, back in the 90s, early 90s? Good night. I mean, just impenetrable. And so, I mean, Troy Aikman had all the time in the world to throw the ball, but Emmett had a wall to run behind. But... 
If you've ever been to Cowboy Stadium, you've seen the Ring of Honor with great names like Don Meredith, uh, uh, Randy White, Roger Staubach, Bob Lilly. Now the triplets are up there now. Um, but I can imagine Emmett being in that backfield and looking up at that Ring of Honor every once in a while when he was still playing. And one particular name would stand out to him, and that would be Tony Dorsett, because he played Tony's position. And so now, you know, he's thinking, as you were, I now am. Amen. Jesus Christ, as he was, you now are. He's ascended into heaven, and you are his body in the earth. And the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. Say that with me. What he was on earth, I now am. That's good to know, isn't it? All right, lastly, now the Lord spoke to Paul. This is Acts 18, 9 through 11. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Now, this, is, this is where Paul came to Corinth, right? That's where we get the, the letters, First and Second Corinthians, or to this particular church. This is a real important church in the grand scheme of the kingdom of God and of Ch Paul's church planning process. But Paul stays there a year and a half. Now, this is not like Paul to stay in one place very long. He's traveling, he's moving, he's planning a church here, moving on to the next town, to the next town. But here, he stays. And I think there's a real good reason why Paul stayed there, because the Lord said, no one here is going to attack you. He thought, finally, <laughs> finally, I'm not going to get beat up. I mean, five different times, five different times he received a Jew's beating, which is 40 minus one. 39 times five. This is how many times Paul got beat. Now, that's just one of the things he went through. Another one, he got stoned to death and drug outside of Lystra. And somehow, by the grace of God, by the power of God, he came back to life and the next day walked 20 miles to the next city to keep the gospel going. This guy went through it. He was shipwrecked three times persecuted from every, it seemed like every city, the Jews were always falsely accusing him. He found himself against all odds all the time. And so the Lord gave him this good news. No one here is going to attack you. He thought, okay, the, I'm going to chill here for a while. And he stayed there a year and a half there in Corinth. God has a vision for you. Now listen, to connect and to be planted. To be planted. It's so important. The Bible says that those who are planted in the house of God will flourish in the courts of our God. Or in other words, anything outside the house, all right? You're gonna flourish where you, where you live. Your whole life will flourish as a result of you being connected and planted in the house of God. I'm grateful for that today. Now, I have to admit, not every reason I came to church was for all practical reasons of spirituality. When I was a teenager, I came to church because there were girls there. <laughs> and I was deathly afraid of my dad, too. But I knew I had to be in church. But, I mean, you have whatever gets you there. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Maybe your motivation isn't all that straight and narrow, but that's okay. That's okay. If you're there, stay there. Because, you know, sometimes it's just kind of routine. You're like, okay, I come to church this week, now I come to church next week. But don't ever, ever underestimate the power of routine in your life. I can remember even a time in my life when I was, somewhat straying a bit, but I knew Sunday was coming and I knew I was going to be in church. You know, you just really can't stray that far when you know you're going to be in church the next week. You just, it's just hard to do. It's hard to break away because you're going to be back in church on Sunday or back then it was Wednesday and Sunday. So it was every few days. I mean, how far can you stray if you just stay in church? You really can't. Now, I'm not, I, I, now I'm not saying God can't move you to another church because, you know, I think all of us have experienced that from time to time, but he certainly isn't going to do it every couple of weeks, okay? You've got to get there, get your roots down, get planted, and I'll finish with this story. This, um, just last year or a year before, I don't remember, you don't remember Pastor Charles Neiman out in El Paso. We take our staff to their church um, conference every year. Well, they, a couple of years ago, they opened another location there in El Paso on the east side, east or west side? West is their newest one? Okay, well, either way. And well, on this property next to them, they had had these high winds come through this storm, and these huge oak trees had blown over. But not all the oak trees on this property had blown over. There were some that were standing tall, weren't even bothered by the winds. 
And so he, Pastor Charles, was asking the lady who owned this property, he said, why do you think that is? She said, I know why it is because these, I had these tree guys come out and had to cut up the trees and, you know, for firewood and all that. She said, they told me why, because I asked the same question. He said, they said, th these trees, it's, this is an easy answer to this. The trees that are still standing are actually seeds that were planted for those trees. I said, he said, the trees that fell over were those where an acorn just hit the ground and began to sprout. So their root system isn't deep like the ones that were planted. Even though they look the same, same size, but when the trouble comes, listen to them, when the trouble comes, you got to get planted, connected, and planted. Get your roots down so that when the storm comes, you don't blow over. Amen. 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 And you don't blow your top. The right conditions for you to grow are found when you're planted and get your roots down. This is God's vision for you, to connect and to be planted. Also, God has a vision in this world of the need for you and your gifts, and God has a vision for you for a new beginning. Father, thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for your wonderful grace and mercy that your word says, teaches us that every day your mercies are brand new, brand new. Yesterday's mercies are where they are. You have new mercies for today and you'll have new mercies for tomorrow. So we look to you now, Lord, I thank you that you just touch lives how you know how to do it. You look at the heart. I can't see that, but you can. And I thank you for ministering to every individual, Lord, how you know that they need to be ministered to, that Lord, that hope, Lord, would be refreshed and rejuvenated in their hearts today. God, I thank you for healing. Maybe there's some who've come in here with broken hearts today. You are the one who binds up the brokenhearted. You are the one who heals. You are the one who delivers and, and restores. There may be some who are battling some kind of physical ailment today, some kind of chronic pain. Lord, I thank you right now that you sent your word and you healed them and you delivered them from their destruction. There may be some who are here with financial uh, struggles. Lord, I thank you that you will supply all of their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And we thank you and praise you that, Lord, you know what we have need of before we ask, but you said ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. We thank you, Lord, for the confidence that we have in you, that when we pray in the name of Jesus, we ask anything in his name, it shall be done. Bless every family here, that grace and peace will be multiplied to them from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and may he keep you and may he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and all of your house and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Praise God. Come on, Pastor Alex. Amen. Such a great message, Pastor Eric. Thank you so much. Hey, I just want to remind you all before you leave, we've got prayer group. If you want to come join us today at 3 o'clock. And then we've also got a lot of things going on in December. So before you book your calendar, Make sure you go to our app, figure out all the information, and make plans to be at our events because they're going to be so much fun. We love you all. You all have a great Sunday. We'll see you soon.